So welcome to our Athenry Virtual Festival 2021 and in this talk I'm going to explain some of the basics about 16th century matchlock firearms. So it appears that the Chinese were the first to develop gunpowder. The first recipe for gunpowder appears in 1267 by a chap called Roger Bacon and it appears that firearms appeared in some numbers from at least in the Western world from the early 14th century. So what was gunpowder? Gunpowder was a mix of three ingredients. First of all, you had saltpetre, which was about 75% of the overall mix. Saltpetre was an extract of urine, also known as potassium nitrate. You also had sulphur, which was 10%, and then the final 15% was made up of carbon in the form of charcoal. The mid 14th century appears to be the earliest date that we have for a firearm recorded in Ireland when one example was sent over from England to Dublin. The first use of a firearm that's recorded was in 1487 in the Annals when an O'Donnell shot a no work. So over the course of the 16th century, firearms became more and more prolific all across Europe, in England and in Ireland. So for example, in England in 1547, one inventory of Henry VIII tells us that there were 6,700 arquebuses in storage at the Tower Armoury. Not all of these firearms were probably made domestically in England. Many of them were imports from important production centres on mainland Europe, including Nuremberg, Frankfurt, Metz and Milan. Spain and Flanders were also important um, providers of small arms and Flanders furthermore supplied England with heavy artillery, while Spain throughout this period also supplied England with powder. That is, of course, until the time of the Spanish Armada. In Ireland, firearms were also becoming more and more common, especially under the chieftaincies of people like Shane O'Neill and later on Hugh O'Neill, both uh, leaders of the O'Neill clan in Tyrone. Under Hugh O'Neill, we also believe that firearms may well have been manufactured in Dungannon. In fact, there's some evidence that there was three fabricators of firearms sent over by Alexander Stewart of Glasgow to O'Neill in the 1590s, near the start of the Nine Years' War. Also, during this very same period, it seems to be the case that O'Neill had made some effort to begin a fledgling production centre for providing the saltpetre for the powder. So, in terms of the carriage of the powder, how was the powder carried? Well, the main kind of piece of equipment that was used towards the end of the 16th century was called the bandolier. And sometimes the bandolier is known as the 12 apostles because it has 12 of these bottles or boxes hanging from it. However, that's probably a Victorian term. And back in the 16th century, these boxes were known simply as boxes or as charges. Each box was normally made of wood. Sometimes they were made of tin plate as well. And copper plate is also now known from the Alderney wreck. The top or lid was also made of wood, but often these lids could break during campaign. So sometimes they were replaced with a tin or a lead lid that could be more easily cast in the field. Each box carried one charge to fire one round from the musket or the arquebus. And it hung on a string from the belt of the bandolier. Because it hung from a string and the string passed through these perforations here, it meant that when the lid was raised, the musket man would not lose the lid. So it's all very tidy. Also on the bandolier was a small pouch. The small pouch was for the bullets that you needed to shoot the guns. So in other words, powder and bullet are separate in the 16th century as opposed to the types of bullets we have today. Just looking at some of the bullets, the bullets were basically what looked like steelies to us in school. Steel form of marble we used to play with back in the day. They made of lead and these also could be cast in the field. The size of the ball would usually conform to the size of the barrel or the bore as it was known. There were two types of powder, however. Well, ideally there was two types of powder. You had the main charge, which was usually fairly rough stuff, cheaper stuff. Think about sugar and the consistency of sugar. 
Then you had finer stuff that was used as a priming charge. And the priming powder was much finer, much more like the consistency of salt and was more expensive. Um, so usually there was one special bottle or charge or box that was used to keep the priming powder. And this one, as you can see, has a, another type of lid to identify it. And this one hung, in this case, directly from the pouch that kept the ammunition. One of the reasons the musket man needed to separate his charges was because he needed to know exactly how much to use to shoot the gun. Too little and the shot would lack range and accuracy. Too much and it could be dangerous. The gun could be breached or it could fire back into the shooter's eye. An alternative to the bandolier was known as the portache. And whereas English musket men tended to use the bandolier during the Elizabethan Wars in Ireland, we think it was more common for the native Irish, the Spanish and the Italians, for example, to use this style in the late 16th century. It's basically a wooden flask. It's reinforced with metal, it has a nozzle on the top. There's one lever, quite obvious from the side here, which releases the powder, but there's a second lever at the back and that second lever ensures that the correct amount is in the nozzle. So just like the bandolier, we're putting the correct actuated amount into the musket. Also on the portage, which is basically just a stiff strip of leather, you have a musket ball pouch, again, to hold your ammunition. Usually this was attached by the belt and held on the right hip. It was also quite common for bearers of portages to also have a second, smaller flask to carry the finer priming powder. Huntsmen usually had more fancy portaches or powder horns than the ordinary soldier. And this one here is an original one from Augsburg in Germany and dates to roughly around the turn of the 17th century, so let's say circa 1600 to 1610 or thereabouts, and it depicts a hunting scene. You can see the hound, the huntsman, and his quarry. So I'm now wearing um, the bandolier, and as I said, there was some national trends in terms of the carriage of powder, but those rules could easily be broken in times of strife and necessity. Um, the bandolier is normally worn over the left shoulder, so therefore, the ammunition bag ended up in your right hip, as did the priming flask. Now, the other thing I have in my left hand here, apart from the musket, is the match. And this is where the match lock gets its name from. The match was basically hemp cord that was soaked in saltpeter, left to dry for a week or maybe a bit more. And that ensured that this match, when lit, would burn at a very slow rate of just one inch per maybe six to seven, maybe eight minutes. Some of the disadvantages of the match, by the way, was that in the dark, if you're trying to surprise your enemy, it would give a glow. It also made a smell, which made it not a fantastic weapon for use as a hunting weapon either. So how did you fire a matchlock musket? Well, the first thing you needed to do was to open the pan with the swivel cover here. And you can just see that little dish there. And at the back of the dish, there's a small little perforation that leads into the chamber of the barrel of the gun. So it's important to keep that clear. So you first had to prime the musket, and that meant using your priming powder, and you'd fill your little pan, and then recover it with the pan cover. Then you would have to drop the musket and take your main charge from one of the boxes or charges on the bandolier. putting in the contents as so. The next thing you had to do then was to think about ammunition. And that's when you would extract a piece of ammunition from the uh, ammunition bag on your hip and drop it down the barrel. There was a third item to go down the barrel after the powder and ball though, and that was a piece of wadding. Now the piece of wadding could be a piece of cloth, a little scrap of linen, scrap of wool, or it could just be a piece of grass on the battlefield. Either way, you drop that piece of wadding down and then you would use the scouring stick, or ramrod, as it was later known, to put everything into place. 
The reason you needed the wadding was because if you didn't have it in there, there was a possibility that the lead ball could just drop out before you had fired it, so kept it in place. For modern movie work, we of course don't use ball, but we still use the wadding because it gives the gun a nice pop when you're shooting the gun on set. So that's the gun loaded. The next thing to do then was to take one end of the match, the one that was lit, this one, shall we say, and put the match into the serpentine. And then if you had time, you could check to see did it reach the pan. And if it didn't, you might have to readjust it. So after the gun was loaded, you then had to place the match, whichever end was still alight, into the serpentine, which is this part here. And then you could check if you had time that it would reach the pan. And if so, you would open the pan and upon the order, you would give fire by pulling the trigger here. Effective range of early modern muskets probably varied quite a bit, but effective range is probably range from roughly 70 meters to maybe 100 meters at best. Muskets were heavy weapons. This one, for example, weighs four and a half kilos, which is roughly the same as a Hoth Mauser, which was used during the 1916 period. So sometimes muskets were used in conjunction with a rest like this, which you would hold in your left hand while you discharge the musket with the right, usually leaning into the musket to absorb some of the recoil at least. There was a lighter version of the musket also in use during the Nine Years' War in Ireland. And it was particularly common with the native Irish, although the Elizabethan English army also used these weapons and they were called calivers. It's almost exactly the same weapon. It's essentially um, a lighter, smaller version of the musket known as a caliver. Um, unlike the musket, it doesn't have a trigger guard here. It has a long trigger there, as you can see, but the mechanism is very similar. Um, it has a kind of crook-shaped shaped, um, stock. Usually these stocks and muskets and calivers were both made of heavy hard wood, such as beech or walnut. The big advantage of this gun over the musket was that it was lighter. It suited the Irish style of warfare very well, the skirmishing style of warfare. And um, yeah, it just weighed about three kilos and, and a quarter, which is quite a difference if you're lugging the weapon around all day. Another difference between the caliber and the musket was the caliber of the barrel. The musket barrel was somewhat bigger. In this particular case, this musket has what we call a 14 bore, whereas this caliber has 20 bore. The internal size of the barrel of the gun was described by a system called bore. What it meant was, was that if you had a pound of lead, the bore number was how many bullets you could get out of that pound of lead. So in other words, the smaller the number, the bigger the bullet. In our two examples here, the caliber has a bore size of 20. So 20 bullets per pound of lead, which is the same as saying that it has a diameter of 0.615 of an inch. The musket has a larger bore size, but the smaller is number. So the number is 14, 14 bore. And that corresponds to a diameter internally of the barrel of 0.693 inches. The matchlock musket dominated 16th century warfare in Europe and it became more and more important in Ireland in the same period. And in the 17th century, the matchlock musket still continued to be the main small arm used by armies until around the time of the Battle of the Boyne. However, there were rival types of mechanisms that negated the need for a priming charge. For example, you had wheel locks coming in in the very early part of the 16th century. In 1505, for example, we have an early reference to one from Nuremberg. And then we also had, coming in just after that, the earliest flint locks as well. The flint lock later on would displace both the wheel lock and the match lock. But that, my friends, is another story. <laughs> <laughs>